your Bibles, please, and turn to Exodus chapter 3. You can cite it both, and there's an outline for you to follow along. Set free from fear. We talked at our intro. Uh, fear is a crippling uh, emotion, focus, and perspective that will steal everything it possibly can from you. In fact, uh, what fear does to us, a few things I want you to write down, uh, it steals our dreams. You know, when you go through a time of fear, uh, it'll chop your dreams right at the knees and take it out. And then all of a sudden, you're not sure about whether that's from God or from someone else, or it's just my ideas. Uh, you ever thought that way? You ever thought, wow, is this from God or is it just me? Uh, reveals insecurities. When you have a time of fear, you go back to these places where you start over-reflecting and start demeaning the very gift that God made you into. You start looking at all your flaws and weaknesses and all your regrets, the things that didn't turn out well, the things you've done wrong. It also rehearses what I can't do. It starts telling you and reminding you that you're not equipped. You're not smart enough, strong enough, wise enough, healthy enough, rich enough, whatever it may be. And it reveals and rehearses all the things that you can't do. That's what fear does. It doesn't give you positive reflection. And fourthly, it makes you feel alone. You ever felt alone? You can be in a crowded room and still feel absolutely alone because you have some sort of fear that says, you know what, my insecurities are this, this is what I can't do. And then in spite of who's around you, you start feeling like you don't deserve to be around other people. And lastly, it triggers an excuse mechanism. I love that one. That's my favorite one. Triggers an excuse mechanism. You know, it, it's the easiest thing to do in life is make excuses. Amen? Amen. Yeah, if, if you don't look for a way, you'll find an excuse. That's really what it comes down to. Well, the steps to being set free from fear are important. Uh, I'm hoping it will be life-altering for you today. Uh, every week I pour out a lot of time, energy, resource, prayer, my own relationship with God to come up with what God, I believe, wants to teach and equip His people to overcome in their lives. Because a lot of times it's not just getting saved. It's not just getting to church or reading or praying the Bible over the Bible, or giving, or doing certain things that are noble and a, of a good cause, it's really about breaking free from certain things that hold you back from becoming the man or the woman you're supposed to become. That's an amazing thing. I think about it, what we do glorify today, uh, everybody know George Clooney? Not personally, right? Okay, otherwise you'd be in Italy and at the wedding on a boat somewhere. Uh, but, but, you know, we celebrate people who make movies or play sports or sing songs or do certain things like that. And their sense of accomplishment shouldn't be any more important than what you and I do. But more often than not, we end up taking the back seat to what we call celebrityism. You know, we pay people ungodly amounts of money to throw a football around or hit a baseball or, or put a ball across the green into a little hole. And then we don't pay our, our teachers and our firemen and our police department and our city workers and, and people that actually do day in and day out tasks that elevate the level of our community. And it's all based on the fact that we don't see ourselves the way we should. You don't see yourself how God sees you. And there's steps uh, to being set free from fear. And we're going to look at that right after we pray. Heavenly Father, there is really no way we can give uh, the right perspective and focus without your help. Holy Spirit, as we say we rely upon you so often, we sing uh, songs that we don't always believe, but we now have another uh, opportunity sitting in front of us where we can engage with our time together in your word, and even a flawed messenger like myself, when it sins at times, um, we know that you, Holy Spirit, can take this and make God's voice. God breathed. I pray, Heavenly Father, you'll awaken our hearts, our minds, our ears, everything about who we are. Reach deep within our soul to a place where you make a, an impact on our lives that literally would change us today. We anticipate these things because you're a God who spoke the sun, moon, and stars into place, and there's no reason why you can't speak things into us today. We look forward to and anticipate great things from a great God, that you get all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Steps to being set free from fear. That's really an important thing to understand. Uh, and if you're going to do that, uh, there's three things I want you to at least look at uh, this week. Because I don't know how long this may go on. We're going to talk about fear. It's a big subject. But we're going to try and tackle some of it today. God will give you a dream that exceeds your plans. 
That alone creates fear in a lot of people's lives. Just knowing that something is so much bigger than you and me, it automatically you're going, hey, that's how I, oh, I'd suffer being a millionaire. Oh, really? You know? And as soon as you got it, you'd go through a time of fear because you'd be saying, oh, what is the requirements, the responsibilities? Will I blow it? You realize that 96% of all people who win the lottery end up broke within three years? has nothing to do with the money, has to do with the person. That's the problem. They don't know how to handle success. And God says a lot of times the steps to being set free from fear, number one, God's going to give you a dream, but it has to exceed your plans. It can't be matched with what you think you can do. Look here, uh, uh, it's fascinating, in, in the book of Exodus, we've seen and read this and, uh, before, in chapter 3 it says, now you've got to understand something, Moses has been on the backside of the desert for 40 years. What, what have you been struggling with? Uh, how long have you been struggling with it? Uh, what have you feared for so long? Do you realize this was a prince of Egypt? He was in the line of being Pharaoh with the right moves and the right things happening. This guy was one of the most powerful people on the planet, and now he's on the backside of a desert for 40 years. He's no longer in a palace. He's herding sheep. You know, I walk through my laundry room door when my dogs sleep. It don't smell like Febreze, okay? It smells like dog. And especially if they get a bath or it rains. It really, you ever smell wet dog? It's not, ooh, I, I, I got to get a salad dressing that smells like, you, you don't, and for me, that's a big deal, salad dressing. And, and when you think about it, he's around sheep now all the time. He's not smelling good, dressing good, walking in nice marble floors. He's out in the dirt. He's out there where the elements are at. He's out there with sheep. He's no longer top dog. He is at a place where he never thought he would be. Have you ever been that way? And said, thought, how did I get here? It says in chapter 3 and verse 1, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro. It wasn't even his own flock. He's worked for somebody else, making them money. Doesn't that just give you a quiver in your liver? The priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked. You know, that, that's great theology. You know, the, the word for that is duh, right? You know, if you saw a bush that was burning, it's fascinating. And, 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 but the bush wasn't consumed. This, this was beyond, this was BS. This is before Spielberg. This is, this is something that's remarkably different. You know, they didn't have CGI at this point. All of a sudden, this bush burned. Okay, maybe lightning struck it, right? Maybe something like that happened. But, but there was no lightning. In fact, the bush didn't get consumed. This was a moment in which God was going to give him a dream. And God gives these, they're called seminal moments, in which God pauses you just for a minute, takes you away. Here's the real key ingredient. He doesn't do it, and he doesn't give you that dream when you're busy and you're around a lot of people. He pulls you aside, and he gets your attention, and you know it's him. That's crazy. You know, because when you, when you make up your own dreams, here's what kind of what happens. You know, when I grow up, I'm going to be a purse. You know, that's, that's what we end up coming up with, with the logical next step. That, you know, we're very logical people. We do A, B, C. God goes A, Z, R, Q, and he, he does it completely different. In fact, if you want to hear heaven laugh, start telling him all your plans. And you can say, oh, that's pretty funny, because it ain't going to work, because it's not you, and you couldn't handle it anyway. I've got something designed just for you. Fear says, no, I've got to make up my own rules, my own plan, my own path, and, and I'm going to plow through this thing. And God says, the problem with that, you're not going to get as far as you'd like to get. In fact, that's why people end up in jobs they can't stand. Relationships they should have never been in. Health issues, because they did not listen. There's so many different things God wants. He says, I want your goals, I want your dreams to exceed your plans. And it will be from me. See, it's got to be just a little bit bigger than you. Wow. If you're going to dream big, that, that bad boy's got to be big. It's got to be something where you're going, I don't know about this. But anytime God gives you an elephant to eat, you know what you got to do? One bite at a time. It's not just, oh, it's so overwhelming. But he can't give you that big dream until you're ready. Say, oh, I'm praying for this and I'm praying for that. Well, that's great, but did God give you that dream? Because if he did, first of all, it's going to be much bigger than you ever dreamed of. Second of all, it's going to seem a little overwhelming. Third of all, it should make you a little bit nervous. There's a guy that wanted to golf with Tiger Woods. Loved to golf. 
And Tiger asks him, he goes, hey, you want to play for a little money per round? The guy, got, the guy goes, well, well, sure. You know, he says, I'll give you some strokes so it kind of evens the score out. And he goes, well, how, how much do you want to bet, Tiger? And he goes, whatever makes you nervous. That's what it's about. See, when he came into this, this event, this burning bush experience, he didn't anticipate it. See, when we start telling God what we're going to do, it, we're just like Peter telling Christ he can't die on the cross. Come here, i got to tell you something, God. This is what we're going to do. And see, the burning bush experience shows up when you're ready. If you haven't got that huge dream that makes you a little nervous, a little worried, and puts you in a position where you're praying about it day and night, guess what? It's not from God. Because we can get a lot of dreams and goals and visions from people, can't we? But it doesn't stick. We want something that God's going to do. That, that, that's really the basis of this. If you think about this, if you haven't felt like quitting, your dreams aren't big enough. That's the goal. It shouldn't be so past you that you're going, gosh, I don't know if I can do this. That's exactly where you need to be. You know, this is the second church I've started. And you know how many times in both churches I wanted to quit? Every other week. Every other week. It's easy to get a job at another church. They just send you a paycheck. And you just go through the motions and do your job. But it's got to be past me. It's got to make me want to feel that way. That's what makes me feel like I'm spiritually, I've got to have God. And if you can't say that, it's not from Him. You know, this story of Moses is remarkable. I love this because he sees the burning bush, it's not being consumed, and he's probably thinking, uh oh, you know, that's probably what he's thinking inside. He ain't thinking, oh, Heavenly Father, you know, he's not doing that. He's, he's terrified. He's overwhelmed. He's moved to a place where nothing else matters. When God gives you a dream, all this little stuff that you nitpick and go through and make such a big deal out of starts to fade away, and you start saying, that stuff doesn't even work anymore. But he's got to get your hands loose from the stuff you got. You can't get something better if your hands are tightly wrapped around something that's average. Verse 2 it, it explains it all. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. They capitalize it in a lot of your Bibles. It, it, all, everything in, in, in the Bible was written in capital form, uh, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. And you'll recognize they capitalize this to kind of give you like an epiphany that Christ showed up. We don't know. It could be. It doesn't matter. God's involved. And it says, and appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. We see this later on in the book of Daniel where uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown in that furnace of fire. And there was a man that appeared as the son of man in the fire. Uh, they didn't get burned. They didn't scorch. There's no smell of smoke on their body. I mean, when God's involved, it doesn't matter what the context is. It doesn't affect him. And if he doesn't want it to affect you, it won't. If he lets it affect you, guess what? He's got a reason. So he looked, good move on Moses' part. Behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Uh, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Yeah, that's just a profound thought, isn't it? I think I'll, I'll take a peek, right? And, and why the bush doesn't burn. You would think there are burning bushes on every freeway in California, the way people uh, pull over and watch somebody's fixing a flat tire. We pull over and we give our attention, our focus on stuff that's absolutely phenomenal sometimes, isn't it? So when the Lord saw that, he turned aside. He finally got Moses' complete attention in verse 4. God called to him from the midst of the bush. He said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. He never questioned, why is the bush talking to me? It's like Balaam in Numbers chapter 22 when the donkey starts talking to Balaam. He, he just starts arguing with the donkey, right? He never goes, wow, why is my donkey talking? <laughs> I mean, if my dogs tomorrow morning get up and start having a discussion with me about why we eat the same food every single day, I'm not going to worry about the food anymore, right? <laughs> I'm calling Barnum and Bailey. You know, we're going to get these dogs some money. <laughs> we're going to get them a job. And it's fascinating. He's in the midst of this bush, and Moses uh, turns to him and says, Here I am in verse 5, and he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. When you come into contact with Almighty God, it's separation time. Sanctification, that Greek word literally means to be set apart, pulled aside. John chapter 17, verse 17, he says, 
Your word is true. Separate or sanctify them by your truth. See, that's the difference between somebody who walks with God and somebody who doesn't walk with God. When I hear scripture, I get a little excited. When I hear a Christian song on the radio, no matter whether I'm, I'm floating like a river or a fountain or something like that, I still equate it to my relationship with my God. That's what scripture does. It speaks to you in a remarkable way. That's why when I tell you, get into the word of God on a regular basis, I guarantee he'll say something. He speaks to us all the time, but we're so busy. We're getting filled up with this and that and the other. We got voices everywhere else. We got money pulling our hearts and we got all this different stuff tugging on us. You know what those are called? False gods, foreign gods. You must realize that Moses just, he's getting ready to go in and help his people escape 10 major gods they had learned by the Egyptians. When those 10 plagues were challenged by Moses and God, that God doesn't work, that God's not real, and he wiped them out. And for us Americans, we have gods like that. It's just they're so subtle, we bought into it. That's why being in God's house is so irrelevant. Because he's not a God that challenges the gods of this world right now. And I think it's going to increase. Moreover, he said to him, I'm the God of your father, the God. And now it helps out because now he feels like he's going to be okay. I wonder if he had a little trepidation going on there. He doesn't know which God this is. He doesn't know what's going on. He'd seen all the other gods. He didn't know if it was an angry God or a nice God. He didn't know if it was a God that was for him or against him. He didn't know if he was getting the backlash of killing that Egyptian soldier and hiding him in the sand. That's the reason why he left, because fear entered his heart. He was used to practicing fear. That's why he ran, even though he was Moses. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Even one who lied and, and manipulated and deceived on a regular basis. I, I'm still his God too. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon. He thought this is an awesome God. This is bigger than the other gods we deal with. He was a little bit afraid. And, and he had no idea what was coming next. And when God finally gets your attention, then he's ready to unveil something you can't do on your own. The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. Wow, I almost forgot about him. I've been back here in the backside of the desert with these sheep for 40 years. I didn't think that that was even an issue anymore. He said, ah, no, 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 I gave you this calling a long time ago, but you forgot. And he's given each one of you a calling, a dream, and for some of you, you kind of forgot. I've heard their cry because their taskmasters for I, I know their sorrows. I know it's, it's a tough deal. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, bring them up from the land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And nobody's seen something like that before. In the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Termites, and all the rest of the ites. You know, you're, you, I'm still going to position them in a place where they're going to have to deal with a little adversity. Every dream still comes with adversity. You're not going to escape it. The problem is, a lot of times, I think this, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. They've got to be big because they have to be from God. If they're average or if they're doable or you know somebody else has done it, guess what? You're just doing what somebody else did. That's not a dream from God. Now, here, Harry, I want you to be just like Johnny. Well, that's great, but I'm not Johnny. I want to find out what God called Harry to become. Or Rich, or Lisa, or Neil, or Dale, or whoever it may be. He doesn't want you to be another imitation of somebody else. What a horrible waste of life. We just turn out like everybody else. It's a fascinating thought because he goes, here's the plan, here's the dream. I'm going to take you from up here in, in Egypt, and I'm going to have them go all the way through the Sinai, and I'm going to take them across to a place they've never been. With all these, They know where these people are, the Moabites, the Hittites, the Edomites, the Perizzites, and so forth. They heard about these people, and they knew there's other places in the world. And it's fascinating because you don't understand how big this dream is. You're going to take not just yourself and your family. I'm going to have you take over three and a half million people with you, too. You know, it's hard enough just to get people, if you go to lunch with a group of people, to get them all agree on the same restaurant, isn't it? 
Can you imagine taking them three and a half million on a journey that's going to last 40 years? How would you like to do that one? And he said, here's the dream. It's huge. It's massive. It's beyond your wildest imagination. And Moses, his mind must have been just flooded with information. Because as an educated man, he knew the world. He knew what was out there. They'd done battles with these people before. He'd heard stories from the people they captured and how wonderful the land is. But God held back the Egyptians in their place because he had a plan ahead. When God holds back some other issues, just long enough, he's keeping you at bay because he's trying to usher you into that next place. See, you have to get to this place where he gives you a dream and it goes past your plans and then you start thinking through, wow, this is going to be something special. But see, this world is slow to learn to grind us down, bring us to a place where we don't expect much. We're hoping somebody else is going to bless us, right? I'm going to get a bonus over here. They're going to do this for me over here. They're going to take care. They're not going to do that. First of all, we struggle with doing that with people we love. And most of us work for people that can care less who you are. That's why your God is vital to your life. He gives him this issue, and he says in verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I'm going to get you involved in a way you wanted to be originally, but you were doing it your own way. That you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. They're not even going to be like on the border. They're going to a great place. But Moses said to God, and here's the problem that he ran into, and here's the issue a lot of us have, is we've learned to, have to come up with a reason why not to. We've learned to come up with a thing called an excuse. Moses says, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh. You know, I haven't seen this family in a long time, and I know how, how self-centered, how unrighteous, uh, how, how ungodly they are, how ruthless they can be, and how much they'd like to kill me. And you're sending me back, and then to take and ask him to take your children out, the people that are building the pyramids, the Sphinx, he said, I'll certainly be with you. He's giving him a promise ahead of time. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you brought the people of Egypt, uh, out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. He says, we're going from serving man to serving God. That's a remarkable thought, isn't it? Because when you think about it, God wants our mindset to get changed. He wants us to get to a place, as 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For I, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in them. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. When you're going to go into that next level, where you're going to break free from the fear that's kept you back, you have to think on terms the way God thinks. You have to have Christ mindset. When Christ walked this earth, did he ever worry about getting killed? No. Captured. Arrested. To go without food, shelter, and clothing. Did he ever worry about God's power showing up when he needed him? What a remarkable time to watch him walk this earth. It was the living personification of how God wants you to walk. You shouldn't be worried about this and fearing that and afraid of this and scared of that and doubtful and anxiety driven and covering your tail in and constantly on the edge when the next thing that goes wrong, I'm giving up. But more often than not, most people do. Because their God is not their God in their mind. It may be on paper but they haven't taken it from that spot in their head down to their heart. That 18 inches is the most untraveled territory known to mankind. He, he tries to tell us also, look at this in the next verse, 1 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, which is the problem. We keep balancing with that, don't we? We want to be liked by them, but we don't want to walk separate from them. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might understand the things freely given to us by God. I wonder what God has got just waiting for you to pick up. Waiting for you to show up. Waiting for you to be ready. Waiting for your hands to be free of all the other stuff so you can pick up what he's got for you. It, it's going to take both hands. You can't do it with one. You ever carry in groceries with those little plastic bags? I like those things. The problem is, as a guy... 
Uh, we're hunter-gatherers, so we go in, we hunt down things in, in the store, and then we put them in the basket, we pay for them, we go out and then we put them in these bags, and then we carry them off, right? And I, I typically, I've got five fingers on each hand, I try to put a bag on each finger, right? The problem is, if you got eggs in one, and, and other stuff in the other, and then ice, not, not ice cream, but milk, and, and, and things like that, that could be hard, and they clash together, your first thought is, what did I do to those eggs? We bought, because we like eggs, uh, 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 last week, the, the five dozen, the big, the big, Carry thing. So I carried it out to the truck by itself. I put it in there in its own spot and put towels around it and, and I protected it, right? So I grab it as I get out of the truck, I unload the dog food and all this other stuff and I go and grab it again, but there were like three bags left. My wife doesn't know this yet. So there are three bags left. So I'm carrying the eggs in one hand, right? And then I go, I go with the other three bags and I'm swinging around. And then the door, the wind blew and the door started to close. So I went like this to cover it. And the bag swung and hit the side of the eggs. So for lunch, I had a, a small omelet and, and, and <laughs> shifted all the other eggs that weren't broken. And that's what we do. That's what we do. See, the biggest issue that God says, when he told Moses, he says, I am who I am. Say that to my people. I sent you. See, the problem is, when you don't get God's dream, that's why you have fear. It's because you're going in your own resources, your own calling, your own power, and your own thought life, instead of going by the Spirit of God telling you what's next. That's why it fails. So, when you think about it, number one, the steps to being separate from here, God's going to give you a dream, and it's going to exceed your plans. That has to happen. If you're going to overcome this fear, you better start asking God in these timely moments where you're alone and say, God, speak to me. God, start to communicate with me. God, I want to know what you're dreaming. What's it going to take to get me ready for that next step? you got to ask these questions. So secondly, your mindset must be from faith and not capabilities. And it's funny because we typically line ourselves up just like a job interview. You ever worry when you go for a job interview, what are my capabilities? And, and if you, how many of you have done a resume? You ever done a resume? And, and do you put all the failures on your resume? <laughs> Lack of confidence, huh? You put on all your best stuff. And, and you, you've heard of people where they, they blow up their resume to look a little bit better than they should be. That's natural. God says, I don't want that. I want you to be in a position where it's not about your capabilities. It's about your mindset. You know, it's kind of like this cartoon about a job interview. A guy's sitting across from the interviewee and he says, thanks for coming in. We'll get back to you as soon as we lower our expectations. <laughs> How would you like God to wait for you on that? Wait, I'm not going to give you anything until I drop down to the level that you're at. Instead of challenging you to come up to a level you need to be at. See, mindset is everything. Your mind is a massive battlefield whether you're going to receive the things of God or it's going to get blown away from you and you're continuing on that pitter-patter way in which you've been living your life. Mediocrity is not a great way to finish. You know what mindset is? Look at this definition for mindset. It's a noun. It says, a set of beliefs or a way of thinking that determines one's behavior, outlook, and mental attitude. That's what, that's what mindset is. It starts from the very core of who you are. When you think about this, mindset, it, it's beliefs, and then it gets put into thoughts, and then those thoughts turn into actions. Your mindset isn't real if it hasn't turned the corner and hit actions which comes up with results. So when you think about this issue, you know, it determines everything about who you are. It determines your behavior, your outlook, and your mental attitude. If your mindset isn't on the things of God, guess what? You're already in trouble. Because your mindset's got to find some core belief that will sit in the center of who you are, and that's your God. If it's money, that's your God. If it's pleasure, that's your God. If it's self-centeredness, that's your God. See, if Christ truly is your, is your Savior, guess what? That mindset starts springing off things. Look at this. It's fascinating what he says here. Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things here on earth. Because typically we think about tomorrow, children, rejection, bills, what's for dinner, deadlines, doctors. What are you mindful or mindful? Where's your mind centered at? That's probably the hardest thing we could think of. Here, here in this, this action that's going through Moses' life as he gets told about who he was, I am who I am in verse 14. And, and, and let's slide on down to verse uh, 18. It says, they will heed your voice. He says, when, when I send you in there, you tell them who I am. 
you know, and you're going to go out into this land and battle with the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the, you know, all these rest of the Hivites and Jebusites. It's going to give them a little trepidation, but there's also going to be milk and honey. It's going to be a land that's plentiful and fruitful. It will change their life. He says, Moses, when I, when I call you, here's the biggest problem we have with dreams and goals. It's not about you. When God gives you a dream, it's not about you. And, and that's the biggest block for anybody understanding the next step in their life. They've got to get over themselves. They'll heed your voice. You'll come and the elders of Israel to the kingdom of uh, the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty good, but Pharaoh's not going to see it that way. Now please let us go three days' journey. Wait a minute, a day off? Are you kidding me? Three days' journey in the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. But I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. You know, it's fascinating how Moses thought. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, God's telling him, which I'll do in the midst, and after that they will let you go. And I'll give you this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. He says, I'm going to turn everything around. All the stuff that was bad, I'm turning it around to another place. And there's going to be favor from the Egyptians. That you may not go away empty-handed. Verse 22, every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silk. They're not asking for a couple of flour or sugar. They say, we're asking for your jewels. Silver, articles of gold, clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. What? See, the dream should ex exceed anything that you could possibly come up with. Chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose the, they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Yeah, that would be an easy thing to say because he hadn't been around for a long time. His people had turned their backs on him. And you wonder what, where God is. You know, God never moves. If you feel like he's not there, it's because you moved. He said, well, what's in your hand, Moses? And he said, a rod, a stick. He said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and became a serpent, Moses. But now, wouldn't you as well? That's a fascinating thought. He has this staff, his shepherd's staff, and he throws it down and it becomes a snake. That would freak me out right there. I told some of you before, uh, it was my second or third trip to Africa that uh, one of the huts that was next to my hut, the, uh, the natives, the locals there, had, had a big, everybody screaming, yelling. So I came out of the hut. It was you know, early morning. I came out, and up inside the thatch roof, they built them with thatch roof, which is great because it allows the air in, but the problem is rats and mice go up in there, and snakes typically go up in there too. Well, what they found in there was a mamba. If you've ever heard of a mamba, the black mamba in Africa gets up to about 10 to 12 feet long. It's the fastest snake on the planet and the most deadly on the continent of Africa. And I said, a black mamba? And they go, no, it's a green. I never heard of a green mamba. I went and grabbed my camera. I was all excited. Everybody else is panicking. I go, I got my National Geographic moment, right? And this thing was, was a, almost a fluorescent green. It glowed almost. And it was kind of a, a, a young one. It was only about two and a half feet long. And there's and sticks up there and it falls down and lands by my feet and I'm filming this right and everybody's going get out and I was going okay I'll move on and I, I was so fixated on getting a picture of this guy and he was mad it was he was hissing and striking out and he was quick and I thought he's quick and I never thought for once that I was going to get hit and finally one of the guys pushed me behind there whack it and they finally kill it with a stick and then they hung it up on the wall because oftentimes uh, they, they travel more than, than just by themselves and it's a warning to everybody that a green mamba is in camp. When he threw this down and the snake slithered, he got his attention. God says, I can take what you have and make it so much more powerful than you ever understood. See, we keep thinking, if I get this or I get that or become this, that I'll have more influence. But in reality, he's just waiting for you to be prepared for the next thing. He'll give you what you need. Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Good thing he didn't say by the head, right? Reached out with his hand and caught it and it became a rod, a stick once again in his hand. 
that they may believe that the Lord God of our fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, has appeared to you. Should be good proof. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. So he put his hand inside of his, his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. That'll change your day. He said, put your hand into your bosom again. It must have shook him up. He put his hand back inside and drew it back out and it was restored just like the rest of his flesh. Then it will be that they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. He's given them multiple ways in which he can reveal God. And it shall be that if they do not believe uh, even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river Pour it on dry land, and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Great, great thoughts. I mean, when, when he's doing this, he's trying to give him visible illustrations of, of God's power with him. Problem was, the sorcerers of that day could do the same thing and imitate them. And that's basically what's happening today in our society. A lot of stuff that imitate power and strength and wisdom and knowledge. In reality, it's not. I think back, in, if you think of the book of Acts in chapter 2, uh, it's fascinating, when, when all the disciples, there were 500 people up in the upper room, that's including the, the, the 11 original disciples, and they're waiting, they didn't know what God was going to send their way. Christ had died, uh, rose again from the dead, and then he uh, ascended to heaven, and then he goes, go wait and tarry until I, you know, things start reshaping again. And, and when they were up there, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them and it said it was, as tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. There's a visible manifestation to start and launch the church. You know, our problem is we, we try to make it look more like this because we, we think, I, and this is what happens when I eat my wife's hot sauce. It's, you know, <laughs> I can't handle the hot stuff, right? And that's how a lot of people, oh, it's tongues of fire. No, it wasn't like, I, I see it more like in that upper room, more something like that. Where the Holy Spirit just comes upon all of them. They spoke in the language of every person that was there in that city. And the people were stunned. They were amazed. See, the problem is when we get stuck without really having the right mindset, you know, as a result, if you have the wrong mindset, you'll have these ups and downs. As a result, uh, they'll plateau early and achieve less than their full potential if you don't have the right mindset. If you have the right mindset, as a result, they reach higher levels of achievement. You keep going up. That's the whole purpose of it. I want you to realize something here. The problem we have with our minds is that there's a massive spiritual battle that goes on for anybody that gives their life to Christ. Because now it's the battlefield. It can't take your soul anymore. For an unbeliever, your soul is still up for grabs. And in between Satan and God, there's this massive tug of war who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. That's an amazing thought. The people that aren't saved have no idea what that's like. That's why children of God have to have this urgency to grow and walk in their relationship with Christ so they can reach as many men, women, and children as we possibly can. And if we're not doing that, you're wasting the gift God gave you. And it's fascinating. I think about this scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. You have to memorize some of these scriptures. Paul writes down and says, For though we walk in the flesh, we're, we're here in this earth. That we can't help that. We do not war according to flesh. We, you know, it's not about other people. It's not doing things with our own strength and resources. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty in God, pulling down strongholds. That's what this represents down here. That's a stronghold. In the old days, back in medieval times, when they'd invade a foreign land, they'd go in and they'd set up camp and build a stronghold close to the beach. And that was their way to launch out into that country and take advantage of it and finally conquer it. The Vikings used that principle for hundreds of years, taking over all that northern part up in the Baltic states and on down into uh, the United Kingdom area. It was remarkable. They'd set up a stronghold, and then they'd launch out from there and attack and take and plunder and do whatever they wanted to. And people became afraid of them because they had access on their own land. Your mind, look at this, your mind, every thought can, your mind is the place where you either allow Satan's access and information or you allow scripture to come in and, and mediate what needs to be done in your life. 
See, so when you're thinking about this issue, he says, it's mighty man. It pulls these strongholds down. Each one of us has something that keeps sending those signals of fear and doubt and worry and anxiety. And you constantly revolve around these same principles and thoughts and actions that follow it. And you wonder why you're not making progress. Or you're wondering why God's not blessing and opening this door. He knows that you're stuck. That stronghold's so great that every time you have a victory, here comes another defeat. And all of a sudden, you're back again to square one. Does that make sense? Pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. Does God care? Does God love you? Is God there for you? Does he have a plan for you? These arguments happen all the time. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If you look at the time in which you spend with God every week, You'll find out whether you're being filled with the mind of Christ or the world has dominated your mind. I've told you this before. If you're tithing, you're giving 10% of the money that you get. What would it be like if you tithe the amount of time you have every day? 2.4 hours every day to God. That's just that's, that's not a pastor's tithe. That's his people's time. And then, if you even just, just cut it to two hours, where would your measuring stick be for what you tithe with God, time-wise? Being filled with your mind, your thoughts, your dreams and goals. See, one of the things that I learned from fasting, and starting the first church I did in Southern California, the church I was at before offered me a huge package, and a lot, of, a lot of money. They wanted me to be there. Things were changing good for them. But it, it was a man-driven group of people that I was struggling with. A couple of you were there. You know that. And instead of doing that, I, I, I spent a week praying and fasting. Never done before. Hadn't heard anybody else do this. This is 20-something years ago. He says, start a fellowship that will walk with me. Scared? <laughs> I had a school bill coming in. I had gotten a truck while I was in school because I was anticipating getting a job. And uh, I had no money in the bank just trying to get this thing started. And every single week, I was scared to death. It was way past me. Uh, the Purpose Driven Church, we were born, that had not become known yet. This was brand new stuff. In fact, when I selected a name for the church, my mentor found out what the church's name was, and there was another church that had the same name. And they called them. They got all shook up. What's this guy calling us for? They're all in uproar because, you know, David Hawking's calling them. And then, and then they found out where we were. We just got put in the local yellow pages, and, and he told me, I think you need to change the name of your church so I can find you next time. And every week... We'd tear people's houses apart, put chairs up, and a makeshift podium, a couple guys strumming a guitar. I'd get up and give a message, and we just relied upon God to meet those needs. Scared to death. But knowing what he called us to do. And every other week, I felt like quitting. We met from house to house in different houses every single week almost. Because if you met the same house and the amount of people that were coming, the police would be called because there's too many people on their street. I remember times I showed up at the wrong house. I remember showing up and the family was sick and they stayed home. They answered the door and wouldn't open up. I thought maybe I really bombed last week and they wouldn't let me in. They said, no, it's over at Gary and Michelle's house. I'm like, oh, I knew that. They called ahead and everybody at church came out and sat on the lawn and waited for me to get there. They all busted up because I showed up at the wrong place. But that's what it is. It's got to be past your comfort zone. You got to get to that place where your mind is his. See, because when it becomes his, here's what starts to happen. Keep your thoughts positive because your thoughts become your words. That's how you speak. It starts here. You keep your words positive because your words become your behavior. What you speak is what you start acting like. Keep your behavior positive because your behavior becomes your habits. Uh-oh. Keep your habits positive because your habits become your values. Keep your values positive because your values become your destiny. You see all those steps? If you're messed up in any of these steps, the bottom, your destiny's messed up. 
It only takes one. So ask yourself, what are my, my thoughts like? What are my words like? What is my behavior like? What are my habits like? If somebody followed you around with a GoPro camera, what would your habits reveal? How about your values? What is really truly at the core of your life? Because that's going to tell you where you're going to end up. And if those things are in place, you can't help but stumble all over what God's got next for you. So when you think about this, we've got to hustle. Steps to being free from fear. God will give you a dream that exceeds your plans. Secondly, your mindset must be from faith and not capabilities. And lastly, the steps to being free from fear. Stop making excuses by just becoming obedient. Stop making excuses by just becoming obedient. Now, it's funny, you know, we, we would love to be obedient in a lot of things. Isn't that true? You know the Chinese military train their guards to all look the same way with their head the same exact way? This is how they do it. They put a needle in the top part of their coat, and if they dip their chin at any moment, it's going to poke them in the neck. That's the way they train them to be obedient, to look polished, to look uniform. It's not because they're that obedient. They had to do something that would train them that way. Now, it's fascinating, and if any of you like cars, the, the brand new 2015 Chevrolet Corvette, uh, oh, oh, you know, any, you guys can go ahead and grunt real quick. Uh, and it's fascinating because it comes up with this performance data resource center inside the car. So it's fascinating now. Uh, the, the, the company, GM, is, is taking them uh, to task by saying, you know what, we're going to have to bring a lot of these back because if anybody gets in a car that doesn't have your voice pattern, what's going to happen is, all kinds of different signals go off in the car. It'll record you by camera, it'll record your voice pattern, and it has the ability to slow the car down and take your fingerprints. It's called the spy data that only Chevy Corvette just came out with, and they've got to recall them because everybody's worried if a valet person takes your car and goes to park it for you, they get recorded and they say it's an invasion of personal privacy. It's fascinating. When you think about this, to be obedient is difficult. That's why when God said this, I love this in Hosea, I posted this this week in chapter 13, verse 4. I have been the Lord your God ever since you came out of Egypt. Right when you got saved, He's always been your God. You shall acknowledge no God but me, no Savior except me. He says part of the problem is we've slowly accepted other gods into our life. And we wonder where He's at. The craziest part, when you think about this, Isaiah 43, 12, I myself have told forth and have saved and have caused it to be heard. He says, God loves to still speak to his people. Uh, when there was among you no strained God, he says, there wasn't, any, there, there wasn't any impurity in you. So you are my witnesses. That's how you become a witness for God, is the utterance of Jehovah and I am God. That's the basis of it. And when God does something amazing, what happens is he's going to eliminate the excuses you have. You say, well, you know, I should start walking or running uh, in my neighborhood because I don't own a gym membership. Anybody says, well, I can't exercise. You know, they can always walk, right? And, and then you go, well, you know, up where I live, this is what I see outside my front door, and so I don't want to do anything. You know, if you live up where I do, it, it, it's possibly going to happen. You can see a mountain lion. But for the most part of us, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't do some of the things we do. We end up conjuring up the fears, the worries, the doubts, the, oh, it might not work sort of mentality. The fascinating part about this is success occurs when your dreams get bigger than your excuses. As long as you can reason why you don't grow in your faith, reason why I don't share my faith, reason why I don't give to the Lord, reason why I don't get to church, reason why, reason why, reason why, guess what? You will never match up to the successful dream God has for you. You might as well just get parked right where you're at and enjoy where you're at. Uh, my uh, brother and sister-in-law were up this weekend, and they brought their, their, uh, their, their two boys. And, and the younger one, he's around, you know, he's not very old. He's just a toddler. And uh, he got the car seat out yesterday, and I'm doing some slides. And, and he got the car seat, and he's sitting there in the middle of the rug, and he sits on it backwards and it hits him in the back of the head. So he spins it around and sits the other way. And then it goes forward and he whacks himself into the wall. And, and, and my sister-in-law, she's going, you know, Ryan, turn it around this way and don't aim towards the door, the wall, or the floor. She's trying to give him instructions. If you're going to play with that thing, aim it to where you're going to land. It's not going to hurt you. 
And he smiles and he's so he aims it this way, but then when he sat into it, it spun around and went right back into the wall again. He got out and he get, it was great because he was like a little staggered, you know, it was kind of cool. I like that. And, and he looked at it and, and he looked at the seat and he just walked away. He wanted nothing to do with that seat anymore. And God says, when you finally get done with the stuff that you continue to do as habitual practices in your life, when you're done, that's waiting for you. Changing something in you that needs to be changed. In Exodus, we've got to wrap this up, chapter 4, verse 10, he says, Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I am not elevated. He came up with another excuse. Neither before nor since you've spoken. Your, it's not like I got better overnight, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Oh, I wish more people were like that. Amen. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? He said, Let's get down to who controls this situation, this issue, or makes uh, the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind. Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I'll be with your mouth. Okay, since you've got a big problem with your mouth, I'll be with your mouth and teach you what to say. I love verse, you, you think he, he's all in, right? And as a pastor early on, I used to think when people come to church, they're all in. They're committed. They're ready to go. They're going to do God's work. And I, I got sadly mistaken years and years ago, and I got over it. And I realized that's not always the case. Just like Moses. Moses had one more excuse. And he said, Oh Lord, please sin by the hand of whomever else you may sin. And the anger of the Lord kindled against Moses. And he said, It's not Aaron the Levite. He goes, I got an alternative. This Levite is your brother. I know that he can speak well. And look, he's also coming out. There. I, I brought him into the fold. When he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman of the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do signs. Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, and return to the brethren, who are in Egypt, and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. He got every okay, every green light he possibly can get at this point. And, and, and now the Lord said to Moses in verse 19, uh, in, in Midian, go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. In fact, when you murdered that Egyptian soldier and hit him in the sand, they found out all those people are gone. You don't have to worry about it no more. I'm clearing the pathway so it'll make it easy for you. So he took his wife, his sons, and set them on a donkey and returned to the land uh, of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Mer Pharaoh. He's reminding him, I'm with you. I'm with you. My power's with you. My miracles are with you. Uh, everything you possibly need, I've got your back. I've got your back. And you'll say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son and your firstborn. He gave him a warning. Now, the funny thing about all this, when you read Scripture, as a pastor, I want to give you a little illustration about how we kind of look at things. It's called hermeneutical studies. It's breaking down Scripture and tying it together to where it makes sense to everybody else. Just looking at just a simple one, like Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine, in case you've got the old King Jimmy, uh, his own understanding, okay? That's simple. It sounds good. Trust him and so forth. But if you look at how it breaks down, we go through two things every week. Which is God's voice and which is not? That's your job. Satan's voice is this. Give up, give in, run away, deny, blame, distract, excuse, and doubt. Brings accusation, condemnation, and hopelessness. In fact, you end up becoming a slave to what you know you should be doing. Instead of doing it, it's a completely different voice. That's why I said what you speak is what you become. If it's God's voice, is what happens. You, you inquire, you resist, you confront, you confess, you repent, you pay attention, you obey, you trust. Brings conviction, mercy, and hope. It's a slave to righteousness. See, now if you're double-minded and you're walking with God, you don't walk with God, here's what happens. It says, who do you obey? You're not sure where to go. What is God's dream for my life? Why do I fear? 
I'm, I'm high, and I'm, you ever go through that? I'm high one day and I'm down the next. I trust God and I don't trust Him. I walk with Him and there's times I can care less about Him what's on TV. And it's so easy to do that. You know, the soul is really, it's a symbolic gesture of the mind, the will, and the emotions, okay? The new man focuses on the fact that it's spiritual. Its mind leads to life. It's the spirit. The old man uh, focuses on feeling. You know, it focuses on the flesh. Focuses on what makes me feel good. What makes me uh, happy. And it says, and it leads to, it's really about the body. It's not about the spirit. So by faith in God, we are justified, sanctified, and will be glorified. So when I'm trusting the Lord with all my heart, I know exactly what I'm doing. Otherwise, it sounds like this. I trust in the Lord only when it's convenient. I'll lean mostly upon my own understanding. I'll acknowledge Him around dinner and I'll never find out what His path is for me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path. The Hebrew word says, I'll literally make it smooth for you. You find it bumpy. You find it challenging to where you want to give up. You want to complain or or feel wounded and walk in misery and feel like you're, the healing you need in your life hasn't shown up. You've got to learn to trust Him. You know why? Because when Moses finally got to that place where he's leading three and a half million people with Pharaoh on his tail end, right there by the Red Sea, he needed to be ready to trust Him. Or it was all over. He stood on that shore and he saw all these troops coming at him in all their fury. And in Exodus 14, 14, God says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Trusting him isn't getting ahead of him. Trusting him isn't coming up with your own ideas. <coughs> Trusting him isn't going in your own resources. Trusting him is knowing that I can be still and know that He is God. I tell you to, to memorize scriptures all the time. Ephesians 3.20, one of my 1,000 favorite ones. Now to Him who is able to do, I love this, exceedingly abundantly, it's terrible in English, great in the Greek, but it's terrible in English, above all that we can ask or think. To Him be the glory in the church. So he says, when, what you do first glorifies the body of Christ, and in all general, everybody else around you gets blessed forever and ever. Amen. I love the fact he says, I want you to be ready for, and this is part of what this message is about. I want you to be prepared and ready for the dreams that will surpass your plans. Personally, professionally, spiritually, and corporately for the church, I am going to do something big. Father, we thank you for a chance to just look at your scripture has so little to do with me. I already know that. I've been doing this long enough to know uh, my job is to be your messenger. My job is to be your shepherd. My job is to get people to think on your level, your terms. To get ready and prepared for and letting go of the things that they have in their hands now so they can be free enough to receive what you have for them. They'll never ever see what you have as long as they're busy and they have their own stuff going on they will never see the hand of God. You love us too much. You love us right where we're at, but you love us too much to leave us where we are. And I'm praying, Heavenly Father, this morning will be one more step towards overcoming this spirit of fear that has slowed people down for years. We give you praise and we give you thanks. In Jesus' matchless name, amen. amen.